want. Um, so yesterday was a, a very day. Um, we built on some of the ideas introduced uh, on Monday, um, but but extended them further. Um, uh, we began with a uh, discussion of some major tools of of systems data science, um, and that brought out some questions uh, about the relationship. Uh, for example, although some of these occurred later, I think between system science and uh, and complexity science, um, and uh, led to comments during the day about the fact that some of these tools are not um, per se simulation modeling tools, but tools that are model free that that can give insights um, independent of models. But these tools bring together um, a uh, at once a, uh, a recognition of the importance of, of uh, understanding the features of complex systems, systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, the fact that within those systems, we poke them and often there's surprising effects. Uh, even the most educated people, it's been shown in controlled experiments, um, are very poor and manipulating even descriptively simple complex systems. Um, uh, we even, even the best of technical education uh, provides very, very little guidance to help us manage the unexpected effects of these systems. But, but within these systems, um, we also see um, a response to interventions that often is vexing. Um, if we take a complex system, be it a, a, a service delivery network, uh, be it a, um, a system involving um, mental health, uh, uh, mental health uh, burden within a population and, and care seeking, et cetera, um, or a system involving the spread of communicable diseases. Um, these are systems where if we don't understand the mechanisms of action. We don't understand why we're seeing the, the patterns that emerge from them. Um, we're almost bound to, to be disappointed when we try to intervene in these systems. Um, will it, uh, at the least, we'll typically achieve less than we had hoped um, because the system pushes back in some regards or the bottleneck just shifts from one area to another. Um, or we'll be fooled um, into thinking that um, that by intervening in one place, uh, we'll have dealt with the root cause. And in fact, there's many other contributing pathways that ensure the system stays just as um, uh, just as uh, troubling in its patterns. Um, uh, moreover, uh, the system will sometimes uh, dilute the effects of our changes or will intervene and we won't see the effects for some period of time and, and will prematurely declare the intervention a failure before it's had any sort of real chance um, to, to secure effect. Uh, and working with these complex systems, whether they're physical systems or human, human systems, cyber physical systems, um, uh, study of these systems has revealed that, you know, to really intervene effectively, to have high leverage, high cost effective uh, types of interventions, resilient interventions, interventions that put in place fixes that stay fixed, to use Jeff McDonald's words, we really, we really need to understand mechanisms of action. Pawson and Tilly and their theory of critical realism uh, speak about the importance of mechanism, um, context uh, as, as key considerations um, uh, in, in governing outcomes. And, and if you go in and you have a, a policy prescription that isn't properly contextualized, you'll often be disappointed as well. And, and Pawson and Tilly talk about the need to understand the, the causal underpinnings, the generative pathways, the causal pathways um, by which um, these systems work 
so that we can judiciously target them. Um, and, and by so doing, we, we help side, uh, we help greatly lower the chance that we'll simply get effects that are um, minimal or that are so delayed that we don't even realize they'll, they'll occur and, and ditch our intervention too early. Uh, or we'll actually get worse effects, which has been well known um, within the health area. For example, in the introduction of low tar cigarettes, uh, leading to people, you know, ending up avoiding quitting because they think by switching to low tar cigarettes, they'll um, they'll be able to spare themselves from harm. Um, or cases where we invest in low nicotine cigarettes only to find people engage in more compensatory smoking, smoke more to get the same nicotine buzz. Um, the, the history of, of health interventions is riddled with dozens of cases. And I've, I have lists of them, if people are interested, of, of some of the more, um, more notable ones, where you know, well-meaning interventions um, by good people have, have been wrecked on the shores of policy resistance of complex systems. Um, and the antidote to that, it seems, is understanding um, the mechanisms by which they, they give rise. But when it comes to systems data science, there's other features of these systems um, that also bear note. And um, these features are at once vexing, but also provide the seeds for insight and for opportunity. Uh, when we have these complex systems, they are promiscuous. We intervene in one place, say in the uh, physician's office, um, uh, prescribing pains, uh, uh, medications, uh, pharmaceuticals for chronic pain, opioids. Um, and what goes on in that office will ripple through to other areas of the system. It will come out in emergency rooms. It will come out in EMS call calls. It will come out in, in um, in, in police visits um, uh, due to overdoses. It will come out in demand for naloxone in, um, uh, in harm reduction programs. It will come out in supervised injection sites. They're promiscuous systems. What goes on in one place pops out in other places. And this is one of the features that makes, them, makes intervention, successful intervention that's, that's not motivated by understanding really difficult. Um, because we intervene in one place and we get the system-wide effects and sometimes we just shift the bottleneck somewhere else. But this, permis this very promiscuity provides this, this, this beachhead for real insight. Um, because fr from a data perspective, when, we, when we're seeking insight of what's going on in these complex systems, um, we could be excused for thinking that, like any simple system, if we measure things, if, if we need to know about a broad system, we have to measure things all throughout the system to know what's going on all throughout the system. But with complex systems, there's something more going on. They're so promiscuous that what goes on in one place um, is very coupled to what goes on elsewhere. And so, so actually getting information about what's going on in one place whispers to you about what's going on elsewhere. If you know, if you have the right tools for listening, it tells you what's going on elsewhere in the system. Uh, and if we, if we take those tools and we tease apart um, what we're hearing from these systems, we have ways of recognizing um, aspects of what's going on in disparate areas of the system any areas that influence this one. And that's a powerful insight. It's rooted in mathematics. It's rooted in the mathematics of Taken's theorem, um, named after the Flemish uh, or Dutch, uh, I believe he's Flemish, um, mathematician Floris Taken's, um, but who showed that for a, a, a broad class of these coupled nonlinear systems, um, uh, that, that if you just listen in the right way, to one type of data, it'll be telling you about aspects of the state of the system that extend across all other areas of the system influencing this one. And that's powerful. 
um, because it tells us that one type of data consistently measured um, can tell us an awful lot, more than we think. Um, it's not a silver bullet, but it gives the route for insights. And some of the techniques that, that we've already glimpsed, like these hurricane plots, these model-free plots for plotting out what's going on, can often give us insight precisely because of that. And today, um, we'll be expanding on some of those insights with additional methods. So, so yesterday, we talked about these tools of complex systems. And some of those tools are tools for working with simulation models, um, but informing them with grounding on data coming out of the system uh, in ways that really benefits from this promiscuity, ways that really benefits from, from this regrounding of these systems from the fact that, you know, a little data from that system can go a long way. Um, but others of these are techniques for, for listening in the right way to these systems um, and for, for giving insight uh, in other fashions. Um, so those are the tools of system science. And we don't have time during a four-day period to cover all of them by any means. But we can, we can give you some components of some of them, give examples of some of them, and set you up to, to learn more. We then went on to talk about one of the most elemental, <clears throat> most ubiquitous um, or, or widespread, at least of these tools, um, a foundational tool in operational use of models, which is calibration. And I noted that in contrast, um, you know, there's, there's a, uh, this, this notion that, um, uh, you noted this old chestnut, you know, garbage in, garbage out for models that a model is only as good as, as its data. Um, and I objected to that. And I objected to it in two ways um, uh, yesterday, um, specifically. I, I firstly said that um, models are a lot more, uh, are, are about a lot more than data. What m makes a model valuable is more than the data that goes into it. Models capture structure, they capture the orderliness of systems in the world. They capture kind of the, um, the generative pathways of these systems, the connectivity patterns of these systems. Whether it's matters of, you know, uh, who is needed to refer someone to different service uh, services, um, the handoff policies for those services and the workflow, or whether it's matters of the natural history of infection of a uh, of a pathogen uh, in response to infection by pathogen, um, or whether it's issues having to do with uh, the, the factors by which uh, physiology responds to chronic diseases that lead to complications of various sorts unfolding. Um, models capture structure. And in my view, that, that structure is, is of considerably greater import I'm going to revise my statement there to be stronger yet. Far greater import than the particulars of the data that go into them. It's not to say data doesn't matter. It's not important. It is important. It's, it's, it's important to be careful about our assumptions going into these models. But we have to recognize those assumptions come in many forms. And data is just one of them. Um, you know, the, these data we put in, these assumptions. There's other forms um, that assumptions get captured in the structure. And those other forms often have a more found, fundamental bearing on the dynamics that we see from these systems. So data, numeric data that goes into these models is important, but it is um, in the form of assumptions, but but we have to recognize that often it's playing second fiddle to uh, the determinants of structure. And as I said, I, I shared this adage from that's particularly prominent in the system dynamics field, that structure determines behavior. And I noted that the form of that structure um, looks different in, in these different methods. Um, so in, and I'll, I'll share my screen here just to 
to walk you walk you through some examples of structure. Um, uh, so, you know, this is structure as captured in a compartmental or system dynamics model. We have, you know, the progression among different states, the fact that people who, who are temporarily immune following recovery from an infection can go back and be susceptible. Um, that's one form of structure. But we saw that when it comes to service delivery, often our models are capturing key elements of structure in these kind of workflow paths, um, these paths by which they capture the logic by which someone flows through a system. This too has state and evolution of state associated with it, but this is the structure here that drives that evolution of state just as much as this is the structure that captures state and drives its evolution in, in these sorts of models. And then finally, we, we saw this, um, you know, another model where we were capturing structure in an agent-based fashion with state charts. For a given person, uh, each state chart captures a set of concerns. It captures at once the states relevant to that concern that, that are collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. A person's in exactly one of these yellow states at a given time, or yellow and purple. And and then secondly, the actions that can change those states and then the rules by which they govern those actions shown with these little icons and, the, and their particulars. This is structure. Um, and models, uh, by virtue of having this structure, uh, have uh, a great deal of structure in their dynamic behavior. And parameter assumptions, the vagaries of what we assume about the rate of going from here to here, for example, um, uh, is, is important for, for shaping the details of behavior. It stretches it in different ways or it scales it. And sometimes it can do more than that. It can make a difference between an infection that takes off or dies out. Um, but, but often it's this structure that dictates the broad modes of possible behavior. And the parameters kind of tweak um, um, when these modes are, uh, occur, or these modes are triggered, or these modes are triggered. Structure determines behavior. Um, and how we articulate structure will vary between these traditions, with hybrid models mixing that type of structure, but all of it combines to determine uh, the behavior at runtime. Um, so we saw, we saw that was one caveat about this uh, idea this that that points to the problems associated with that, that um, old saying that, you know, garbage in, garbage out, a model is nothing more than the data that makes it up. Um, but there's something more um, to that critique um, as well. And what I said is that um, uh, it belies a mindset which thinks that models are something just downstream of data, you plug into them as, as input and you turn a crank and you get output. And, you know, that's a very common model. We, you know, we, 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 we it's reflected in our spreadsheets, right? We plug in a value here and it pops out and a couple of values elsewhere in the sheet. It's a very common way to think about things. We feed in things as input and out pop outputs. But the truth is models um, have a more textured relationship to data than that. Um, with decision trees, it, it is true. You know, we will put in some, some, some particular assumptions about the probability of one thing happening or another, like what we might do in risk analysis. And, and we'll see the consequences and, you know, the domination of one strategy over another or what have you. Um, but with dynamic models, um, data comes in in a really big way at another point. And often it's most data comes in at a different point. Mm. Um, and where does it come in? Well, it does come in in assumptions about parameters that come, come into the model. There's no question about that. But it comes in as well in this form of calibration, well, it's not in the form of calibration, in 
Uh, calibration is one example of it. It comes in in terms of helping to cross-check, correct, um, uh, or, or challenge model outcomes when we because we can compare them with data. So um, models of the sort that we're working with here have unexpected behavior. They're models of complex systems and they give rise to emergent behavior that can't be interpreted, that can't be anticipated beforehand. And mathematically, in general, it is not possible to write down a formula ahead of time for how a model will behave over time. Um, it's not in the nature of the mathematics of, of, of nonlinear systems. We have, to, in order to know how it will behave, we have to simulate it. And we get surprising behavior. This is one of the reasons they poke back at us when we try to you know, naively poke them. Um, they'll respond in strange ways. Um, and, and so we, we run our models with some assumptions and they will produce behavior that we didn't presuppose in the model formulation. You remember, may remember those patterns from the first day that we saw, the, the oscillations that we saw coming out of a model you know, of infectious diseases or the picture of, of where prions are concentrated alongside the lake shore, et cetera, um, uh, that came out of an agent-based model. Or maybe we'll see bottlenecks within a service delivery system that lead to long wait times. Um, or lead, lead to people giving up and, and not being seen and not having their care needs delivered. These are all examples of, of um, emergent, thing, emergent properties that come out of these models. And in order to find those, we have to run the model. But that provides an opportunity for further bringing data together with models because those emergent patterns can be compared against data can be challenged by data. In other words, can be scrutinized as to whether they hold up against empirical data from the world. Empirical data that's very different from the data we plug in to model at the beginning for parameter assumptions. When we plug data in for parameter assumptions, it's data that you know, we've tried to boil down to, to use it to, to understand one particular parameter. And sometimes there's a process of backing out to arrive at those parameter estimates, et cetera. But it's, it's data that goes into those particular assumptions. Um, and it's very particular data. Whereas the data to which we compare the model's behavior is often um, uh, kind of more observational ecological data on different aspects of systems behavior. It's often much more plentiful. You know, we may have data on the waiting time for this service or data on, you know, the number of, of people being served by that one. Um, we may have data on the number of people being diagnosed with this condition. That's data, it's not about any one parameter. It's affected by a whole swack of different parameters. It's affected by a whole swack of different aspects of the system. But that's what the model captures is the whole swack of different influences. And so we can compare what the model shows for expectations about that against things in the world and adjust our assumptions in the model according. And many of the methods we're looking at, approximate Bayesian computation, calibration, particle filtering today, particle MCMC tomorrow, et cetera, there are different ways of making use of that data from the world, of making use of this emergent data, this data that's unfolding as we observe the world and use it to inform the model. So for calibration yesterday, what we did was to, um, to take observations like that from the world and use them to, to tune certain parameters that can't be readily can't be where, where we don't have good evidence um, to pin them down, where we, we feel that, you know, we lack confidence that we've got really good parameter values. Um, and so in order to inform our best guesses for those parameter values, 
we adjust our assumptions about those. So the model behavior best matches the observed data from the world. You may remember that in that example yesterday we ran through where we, um, we had this calibration going on against, um, against empirical data. The empirical data was, was shown in yellow and we were calibrating model parameters in this SIR agent-based calibration example so that the model best matched the observed data. Um, there, that data being generated from the worlds um, was something which, um, which was the result of many areas of the system interacting and so it is uh, with our model as well. We were comparing against something from our model that was the result of many areas of a system interacting. You may, may remember this. Um, and by running this, this is the historic data which we're trying to match, we're trying to match. And here it's trying different model assumptions. And it's not being very successful because I modified this model. Um, uh, we, we were having the wrong structure. And we found, you know, the fact that we couldn't match this data told us something is wrong with our structural assumptions. It, it, it gave us a best guess for parameter values, but it told us, look, you know, the model results, even with those best parameter values, wouldn't match exactly, uh, it wouldn't match nearly closely the observed data from the world, particularly later on. And so that told us, okay, well, we need to alter our assumptions here. And, you know, we uh, can do that here by saying, okay, we're going to eliminate this assumption that people can quickly lose their immunity or, you know, in a sub-year period, lose their immune, uh, immunity. And by, by so doing that, by altering model structure, now we can start to get a much better match to that data. Structure determines behavior, um, but within that structure, we can find parameters that are better and better. Even here with the correct structure, at first we were casting around for, for matches, but uh, that's the red ones. And, but over time we could get better and better at the degree to which we could match this, this data. So in both cases, both the observed data from the world, the yellow, and uh, the data from the model, the red, that the red is the best of them thus far, um, we, we're dealing with, with data that's generated from across the system or from broad areas of the system, from regions of the system. It's not just from one parameter. And we're adjusting here two parameters um, to find the combination that best matches that data. That was the idea with calibration. And calibration is a very widely undertaken task, so much so I'm, I'm on the borderline of saying whether it's ubiquitous. It comes up in a large, large fraction of modeling projects. And it makes, and it's for good reason, it makes use of the large body of data that's typically available about system behavior. It's not about any one parameter but it can cross check our model results um, uh, uh, in, the, in as much as they have implications in many areas of the system. Um, so that was the idea with calibration. And yesterday we, we, took, up it, we took up that idea and we saw that it's, it's a powerful one, um, but we took it further with a later lecture on approximate Bayesian computation. And approximate Bayesian computation took this basically good idea of calibration and generalized it. Calibration gave us a single best estimate for those parameters. Separately, it also, you know, even more importantly, arguably, it alerted us when the model structure just doesn't cut it. But you know, if, if we are satisfied with that model structure, it will give us the best estimate for those parameters. Um, but it gave a single best estimate. It privileged one estimate. And often 
the situation in the world was not such that you know a single value for these is is terribly privileged above the others. Um, sometimes we have multiple values that vie for plausibility. We may have all range of values, a whole sort of line of values, a curve of possible values, which which are all looking equally good. I said in calibration, it was trying to find the best estimate by taking a discrepancy between what the model produced and what was produced by the world and minimizing that discrepancy, um, finding the minimum discrepancy parameter assumptions. And I analogize that to kind of coming down from a hill or a mountain where we have a high discrepancy and finding a lower one. We're kind of finding our way down these paths into this, this lower region where we have low discrepancy. And that's what we're doing in the optimization algorithm. We're kind of wandering down, trying to find the best way down to get to a, a small discrepancy where the model result has high fidelity to the, to the observed data from the world. But, you know, sometimes we find that when we come down that mountain, there's all valley of possibilities that look pretty good. And sometimes those different possibilities will have rather different policy implications, or they'll have rather different implications for what we expect going forward. And while well, calibration was a good start and an extremely valuable task, you know, extremely valuable process for learning, because models are learning processes, you know, it would be nice to have a method that would let us let us consider more than one possibility. They wouldn't privilege one interpretation. And we got that wish fulfilled at a most basic level through approximate Bayesian computation. It's a very similar idea. In fact, there was the same discrepancy function that played a role in, over here in, um, in calibration, trying to minimize it that also played a role in approximate patient computation. But there, we would accept any, any value of combination of parameters, which had a discrepancy below a certain, a certain threshold. Um, and that led us to have many different interpretations. Um, uh, we would, we might have many different possible parameter values that pass the pass the, the sniff test. They they, they they're, they're plausible enough that they match pretty well and we accept them. And having some doing so having so done, um, we can take those estimates, take those parameter values that pass the sniff test that give rise to model behavior. It's a pretty good match to observe data from the world. And we could then run scenarios going forward with those. And we might see different possible future evolutions of the system that differ in some notable ways. Um, or with, they might have different policy implications as to which policy yields greatest results. And, and by considering many of them, we might be more judicious in our choice of policies, more measured recognize that there's more uncertainty at the table than what a calibrated model would suggest. A calibrated model might suggest this interpretation and therefore this policy is best. Whereas an approximate patient computation um, set of findings that these are all plausible parameter values might suggest, well, it looks like this policy you know, yields the greatest benefit or this intervention seems like or this, has, or this system redesign would be best, but we can't rule out that these other ones may be best. And, and so, um, you know, let's, uh, let's put our emphasis on the one that looks best, but let's um, make a, a strong emphasis on collecting more data that can inform the model and inform our understanding how it's playing out. Or maybe we wanna invest 
you know, soon you do sensitivity analysis with the model, you find, oh, certain assumptions are going to make a big impact here. Um, let's try to pin down information on those. Models, some of my colleagues, Don Burke, uh, uh, formerly Dean of Public Health at Pitt um, and a longtime colleague, uh, uh, or, or uh, Josh Epstein, formerly at, at Johns Hopkins, now at NYU, if I'm not mistaken, um, NYU or CUNY, pretty sure it's NYU. Um, each of them has you know, shown lists of dozens of uses of models, of how models can be used in different ways. Um, but one of the ways they can be used is to, um, to place value on certain types of, of, of data parameters. And often what comes out of calibration, what comes out of approximate patient computation is the ability to say, um, when you're performing sensitivity analysis that, oh, getting this other information, um, you know, would be really, really valuable. I know in our research, you know, I put down 10 to $15,000 on getting certain types of data because I recognize that it's so important. Um, sen model sensitivity analysis shows if only we had the data it would make a huge difference in our in assessing the trade-off between these policies. And it allows us to zero in on that data compared to other data, um, um, you know, as, as particularly important. When you have a nonlinear model, some data is more important than others. Um, the model may have very little sensitivity to certain data and really big sensitivity to others. Um, certain of the data may make a big difference on certain bottlenecks and others minimal. And um, it's useful to have a model to prioritize data gathering um, to, to focus limited energy on a smaller set of parameters. So that was approximate patient computation. It avoided us putting our eggs in one basket. Um, but we also talked about another modeling approach yesterday. And it was different, but it provides a gateway to a lot of discussions today. It was, it was hidden Markov modeling. And hidden Markov modeling was, was different in a, in a couple of ways. Um, but um, one of the ways it was different from calibration, from approximate Bayesian computation, and indeed from methods we'll be using going forward is um, that it focused on a situation where we have an underlying, an underlying um, posit and underlying reality where the system is not in continuous states where we have more people who are susceptible or fewer, more people are exposed or fewer, but instead where we have discrete states, um, say categorically distinguished states, where we're either in a foodborne illness outbreak state for a municipality or not, or where we want to recognize whether a given parties posting on social media are likely to have major depressive disorder or, or you know, uh, less, less severe depression or, or, or to be unafflicted by, by depression set of discrete nominal possibilities. Um, and what, what hidden Markov model tried to do though was emblematic of these methods we'll be seeing particularly today and tomorrow. What, what it tried to do is to have a description of that system, that underlying system um, that it's not taken, it's not lent all the faith, all of our faith. Um, and where we have data um, that will, uh, will check our interpretation of that system. In fact, the, the ways in which hidden Markov models um, uh, couch this characterization was probabilistic trans like, uh, transitions between states. There wasn't even a deterministic aspect of it. It was probabilistic whether we go from an outbreak state to a non-outbreak state. We say, we're not sure. We're not sure how long it will take, but on average, maybe 30% chance per week that a, a given outbreak, a foodborne illness outbreak will end. So we have this 
probabilistic formulation of how a system evolves. This is going to be key going forward with stochastic models, agent-based models, discrete event simulation models, stochastic adaptations of, of compartmental models. So we have this, this, this probabilistic formulation of how a system evolves. Um, and, and then we have data coming in over time. And the data is fallible. The data is ambiguous. The data is uncertain. The data has errors in its measurements. But between the data and the model expectations about the model dynamics, we, we develop a sort of consensus estimate of what's going on in that underlying situation at any one point. Um, we take the data observations and we take the observations from, uh, from, from what we would, or we take what we would expect from the model evolution and we combine them at any one point to give us a picture of what's likely going on right now. And, and that's really, really valuable. It's valuable because it starts to clue us in to um, uh, the evolution of a system where, um, where data um, is constantly regrounding our understanding, but where we have some sense of its regularities as captured by a model, but where that model isn't, as I say, it's not privileged. It's not uh, something which is um, guaranteed to be correct. And these sort of hidden Markov models offer um, a great little uh, example of the sorts of reasoning we're gonna be drawing on a lot today. Um, each state, and for a hidden Markov model, uh, was assigned by the forward backwards algorithm um, or just the forwards algorithms for using only data going, going backwards, um, you know, only data till this point, we, we associated a, a probability uh, associated with being in a given state at a given time based on the data and based on our understanding of how the system evolves. Um, each state here, will have a certain likelihood of observing data on um, certain empirical observations. If we're in an outbreak state, we'd expect more cases of highly credible gastrointestinal illness to be reported through syndromic surveillance or to be reported via you know, smartphone-based based methods, such as the Ethica data system we'll talk about later today. And, um, and so um, we have this expectation of what we would expect to see from a given state. And therefore, if we do see something particular, naturally that's gonna point us towards the plausibility being in states where that's more likely right now. But we don't take that for granted because the data is ambiguous. The data is, has its, its own issues. And so we combine that with an estimate of how we think the system, uh, how the system we believe is evolving over time. And if we had good data that, you know, we were, at, if we had good confidence that we were in a certain state um, in this last little bit of time, the last epoch, um, that will bear on what we think is likely to be going on right now as well. Um, if, we, if we're sure that yesterday we were in an outbreak state, it lends more plausibility that we're in an outbreak state now. And if we see a measurement that's ambiguous, it'll lend us to say, well, probably we're still in an outbreak state. We're not gonna, you know, just um, uh, breathe, breathe a huge sigh of relief and say the outbreak is ended just because of some ambiguous um, measurement. Um, uh, but the system's always changing and we need to take that into account in interpreting the, the data that we see coming in that maybe it did change. Um, so we're estimating the current state using combinations of data coming in that's ambiguous, that's, uh, that's imperfect, fa very fallible, and model expectations that are also fallible to come up with a an, uh, an, uh, probability of being in different, different possible states at a given time. And over time, that probability will change because the underlying situation changes. Um, 
And we could estimate that probability using just data till now. That's kind of the online method as it's, as it's termed, um, somewhat confusingly compared to vernacular. Um, it's only using data till now, or we could use data from kind of retrospectively looking back, what state were we in earlier using data from both before and, and after that. Um, and given a state estimate, then we can project forward. So we could use a method like this to assess whether municipalities like the Indian and foodborne illness outbreak, we could use it to assess whether a given person might be suffering from major repressive disorder, or might be exhibiting separately uh, suicidal ideation. We can use it to, to try to understand the degree to which uh, a person might be afflicted by you know, a chronic disease or, or what have you. Um, so a hidden Markov model um, provides us a way of kind of getting a reading of a situation um, on the state of a system, which has discrete state and traditionally discrete time epochs, um, where we're not giving all our faith to a model and we're not giving all our faith to observations, but rather the two are jointly combining to give to, to lend an interpretation of the situation where that interpretation is always evolving as to what the underlying situation is. Um, and so that was lecture material yesterday, and we'll be building on that in a big way today. Particle filtering methods will build directly on that, those ideas from, um, uh, from hidden Markov models. Um, we'll be assigning uh, probability to different, to different possible states. We'll be not taking data totally at face value as, 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 as perfect. No, it'll be viewed as fallible. And our understanding of how the model evolves is viewed as fallible. We won't be putting all our eggs in the basket of one model. Calibration kind of fell prey to that. And to a degree, uh, approximate Bayesian computation will typically fall prey to that. We kind of count on a certain interpretation of the situation from a model. Um, and that can be problematic because it may not lead us to be as humble as we should be in our interpretation of the situation. And techniques of hidden Markov models and particle filtering and particle MCBC will allow us to have a more, a, a certain degree of modeling humility, recognize that our model is very fallible and our data is fallible, but come up with a synthesis that's more likely. And the truth is these filtering methods um, that we'll be getting into today and they're kind of progenitor in the hidden Markov models, these lie at the basis of many modern ten technologies, um, such as the technologies that track our location on smartphones or on airplanes, et cetera. What we're talking about here is their application in health. So, so th those are the lecture contents yesterday and, and some forward pointers for today. But, but we had some other material late yesterday from my doctoral student, Yuan Tian. And um, Yuan presented um, a case study which involved leveraging a big data source, uh, tweet data. Um, uh, and uh, she did so um, addressing two or three different levels of kind of discourse. Um, so she did so to, to show sort of the broad arc of a project um, that it, that's involved in building up data for a supervised learning system to classify tweets where, and, and she didn't really talk about this part of it, but where that tweet classification would go into then producing daily time series of plausible cases of COVID-19 in the Omicron era, for example, which, um, which might allow us to, um, to have a better read on the burden of infection and illness in this age where um, large scale testing has been really cut back, um, where so much testing is going on you know, at home with rapid antigen test kits and people having, um, uh, you know, engaging in self-testing and never, never calling the results of said tests in. Um, so, 
um, so there's a desire here to sort of, you know, be able to turn tweets into time series, tweets over time into counts over time of plausible COVID-19 cases. And um, in, in her program of work um, that, that she supervised there involved uh, taking tweets, cleaning them, curating them, classifying, uh, excuse me, manually classifying them using a kind of method inspired by systematic reviews where each tweet is reviewed independently by several, several different trained parties um, who, are, who are all trained at a certain level and um, where uh, conflicts are resolved in a certain way, um, adjudicated. Um, and, and then having built up this set of tweets that are labeled as to whether or not they are plausibly a case of COVID-19 in the, in the near, in the, in the recent past, plausibly within this province and, and a set of particular criteria. Um, with that labeled set of tweets, sets of tweets where we, we see the tweet and we have a label whether or not it was deemed a plausible case of COVID-19 in this kind of systematic review sort of fashion. We then, so her team then used machine learning algorithms to classify, um, to, to, excuse me, to, to train those machine learning algorithms using those labeled tweets, those ground truth tweets, those tweets where they're manually labeled. And we trained a machine learning algorithm. This is work of herself and Justin Pointer and Vion Patel um, to, to automatically classify tweets. So using, using the labeled data, it came up with general rules. Um, uh, this machine learning algorithm to recognize when a tweet is very likely a case versus not a case. And this involved things like word embedding. So in other words, recognizing uh, the patterns of words in a given tweet as emblematic of, of what we see in tweets that are um, of plausible cases. Um, and the machine learning algorithm that they came up with, she examined a variety of them. One of them she featured in her talk was the support vector machine um, uh, and, and identified um, strategies that would allow for quite high accuracy classification of these tweets. Um, so doing that mm -hmm. with a machine learning algorithm, you could then use it to take you know, thousands of tweets a day, classify them and come up with a count. Actually, it would be not tens, it would be many more tweets per day but is, are possible, but you could then classify them and, um, and come up with a count each day that are plausible COVID-19 cases. In other words, you could take an incoming time series of tweets, turn it into a time series of, of counts of plausible COVID-19 cases in a way that could then be used by the methods talked about uh, today and tomorrow particularly, um, and, and fed in to reground a model um, and the model's uh, uh, impression about what's going on in the world right now um, to as one type of, of additional fallible data to be processed by these methods to infer the underlying situation in the context of an evolving system, um, evolving COVID-19. Um, so uh, Yuan also showed the code by which she was doing this and she was using a collab, a Google collaboratory notebook, which allowed for interactive, you know, uh, machine learning um, steps uh, where you'd undertake it and you'd issue a command and it would give back the result um, in a style that's uh, that's entirely indicative of what we get with Jupyter Notebooks. There's kind of this command line prompt and you're entering things and seeing the results more or less immediately, um, be it graphical results, be it textual results, and you're modifying your, your, uh, your work accordingly. Um, and she showed sort of how that played out um, over time in, in Google Collaboratory. Um, 
Google Collaboratory is a tool that um, is most commonly used with Python, but can be used with R. Um, and, um, and in general, Jupyter Notebooks can be used with, uh, gosh, a half dozen to a dozen different languages. Um, uh, and she was doing her work there uh, in Python. Um, but she did show some work being done in uh, Spark as well, which is another, uh, another um, high-performance, large-scale um, machine uh, platform for data science. Um, so that was uh, uh, that was yesterday's um, uh, sort of coda, the, the final bit of yesterday, um, and uh, hopefully it you know gave some concrete feel for uh, for what's possible there. Um, if there was large demand to to watch to um, you know help students uh, you know open up a collab notebook and. And, and execute some, some basic commands there. Um, and we could, I'd be glad to see if, uh, if we could deliver on that in these final two days of the boot camp. Um, so what's ahead for today? Let's, let's talk about uh, what to expect for today. Well, uh, first I'm gonna have um, some discussion if people wanna bring up any points here, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to talk about them. Um, we'll then be going on to, to talk about particle filtering. Um, particle filtering takes many of those ideas uh, explored with hidden Markov models um, and supercharges them, um, applies them to the sort of models we're working with here. Um, we've applied it to compartmental models a great deal in our work, but we've also experimented with applying it to agent based models. Um, and particle filtering is a tool par excellence for bringing together observations with a probabilist, a, a, a model of system evolution that includes at least some stochastics, some probabilistic component, um, to get a, a continually regrounded understanding of system evolution. Um, uh, one that is savvy to the fallibility of both of those sources, and, but which can always be corrected um, by, by convincing evidence from, from ether. Um, and we'll see some case studies. So my, my doctoral student, Xiao Yan Li, who is a world-class master at, at um, particle filtering techniques, will be talking about some early work that she did, pertussis and measles, before doing work in many different areas, including, um, uh, including opioids, uh, chickenpox, uh, COVID-19 in a way that informed all provinces of Canada um, uh, through FAC and, and uh, uh, nine provinces through PHAC, uh, excuse me, through uh, FNEB for, um, for First Nations reserves, as well as our own health system here. Uh, we'll, we'll be building on that particle filtering understanding in a couple of lectures as Tom allows. And then we'll return to this issue of big data. And um, we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to, to go on to discuss um, uh, one of those sources of big data in detail. We'll talk about two um, at, a, at a basic level today, smartphone-based data collection and wastewater data. And some of my particle filtering lectures will include some discussion of our wastewater, our way of handling wastewater with particle filtering, um, which is a, a marriage made in heaven, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it, they, they work together very well. But um, one of my other students, Marvi Balak, will be giving a lecture on smartphone uh, and wearable-based data collection using uh, the Ethica data platform. Ethica is a platform that came out of our lab uh, about a decade ago. Um, and uh, well, it was evolving at our lab about a decade ago and then spun out some uh, about a better part of a decade ago. And um, is uh, a, a, a platform for building health studies, leveraging smartphone data, um, uh, which, um, which can be customized to a given area in terms of collection of certain data sources. Um, survey data is ubiquitous, but um, it can also capture data on step counts, for example, 
or uh, GPS data on people's mobility patterns or data on contact patterns between people um, uh, or, or you know, the contacts between two persons or between a person and a service dog, et cetera. Um, and can be used to capture screen time estimates, et cetera, in a way that, that uh, could play a role in understanding, uh, for example, use mental health. Um, this is a platform that's been used in hundreds of studies worldwide and which uh, in many studies informs modeling. Um, so uh, Marvi will be, uh, will be offering a session uh, which gives, uh, gives people an understanding of um, how to use that system, um, both in, a, in its sort of ways of setting it up, of monitoring studies as they take place, of configuring them and, and rolling out content dynamically over time, um, uh, changing them uh, and, uh, and, and using it to, to collect data, which can then be analyzed. Uh, big data of the sort that that's the focus of so much of of, of this boot camp. So anyway, that's um, that's the plan for today right now. But I want to hear if there are questions for people or or things they'd like to discuss before um, you know, or questions they'd like to ask about um, before we dive into some of the lecture contents. Have, have any of my students used MATLAB? Yeah, MATLAB is. Um, MATLAB is one of the oldest tools that our lab has used. These days, we don't um, tend to do that much in it because there's, there are many open source platforms available that offer um, the comparable uh, uh, types of functionality, uh, but with less encumbrances in terms of proprietary, um, proprietary algorithms and so on. But yeah, we've used MATLAB. I mean, I've used MATLAB massively. And when it comes to certain areas like signal processing, uh, MATLAB can be a very, very effective. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a good tool. Um, uh, you know, a lot of things that people use it for are, 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 are sort of numerical linear algebra, um, matrix operations, et cetera. Um, Signal processing is a big area, engineering applications. And that is something which is, um, you know, where it really shines for that. But, you know, the truth is uh, for a lot of image processing that used to be done in MATLAB, you know, we might do now in, in something like uh, TensorFlow uh, for deep learning. Um, or a lot of numerical linear algebra can also be done in, in R, for example. So MATLAB, um, uh, is is excellent for certain purposes, um, but it's no longer as prominent in our toolbox day to day as it was ten or fifteen years ago. Um, hope those are are helpful comments, and and I think you could say this is true for a lot of those outside of um, of core engineering areas, um, sort of engineering of physical systems. Um, um, how much delay is there with tweak data? Take into account the adjudication process. Well, the delay. Uh, so, good question from Maya. Um, uh, so, uh, so I want to draw a distinction when it comes to tweak data. Um, the adjudication and so on is done for training. Is done in preparation of building a supervised learning data set that's then used to build uh, a machine learning model. So, in other words, um, that whole process with the I shouldn't say that whole process. The process with, the, no, no, it's fair to say that whole process yesterday, um, uh, grabbing tweets, cleaning them, scrubbing them, curating them, um, having people judge them, manually classify them um, uh, with multiple people per tweet, adjudicating differences, training a machine learning algorithm. That has to be done once. Um, was the idea. Um, and having so done, having, having built up that trained machine learning algorithm, then that could be deployed every single day to classify tweets with virtually no delay um, so that you get tweets in throughout a day, you're classifying them throughout a day. And every day, by the end of the day, you know, within minutes of the day's end, you've got a count of tweets for the day that are plausible cases of COVID-19. Um, in fact, you can do it all through the day. 
Um, and so once a machine learning algorithm is trained and tested and found you know, worthy, um, the idea is then you just you use it on an ongoing basis and it's more or less immediate. You know, it's ability to suck in new tweets and produce counts. Um, so you get tweets for today and you're producing a count for today of plausible COVID-19 cases, done. Um, that whole adjudication process is a process of building up, of getting to a machine learning algorithm that's worthy. And as was noted yesterday, uh, these days, often when it comes to modeling um, of infectious disease, notably like in COVID-19 or machine learning, uh, ensemble algorithms are of great interest. These take multiple me methods different models, different methods um, for machine learning and, and uh, do the classification with multiple methods and then maybe have a, have a voting protocol, for example, or some sort of protocol that will look at the degree of reliability or confidence of each method and choose the one that looks most favorable or combine the estimates into a single estimate, fuse the estimates. Um, but all that can be done more or less immediately because you have trained models beforehand um, that, that you have to train as a result of this laborious process. So that laborious process is all prior to coming up with a, a re reliable model. And then you can use the model on an ongoing basis you know, for, for months and months and months with virtually no delay. I hope that that's, uh, that's um, clear. How long does it take to train? Um, well, um, you might actually showed a little bit uh, of that yesterday, but you know, to, to go and uh, alter the process of training, as she noted, the hard parts of that project are really um, scrubbing, cleaning, curating the data, coming up with the adjudication process, going through and adjudicating the tweets. You know, those took weeks. Um, and, and then, when you train the model, the actual process of you know building up a trained model um, for a given model it might be you know a couple of days or something like that. Um, uh, that that you might be trying to tune it. Um, possibly could be done in hours. Um, but um, you know, often we end up tuning these models, these machine learning models, so that they sing. They they have their best performance. Um, and uh, you know that may take longer. For example, a support vector machine um, would uh, would potentially you'd want to to adjust some of its hyperparameters, some of its overall parameters, so that it um, um, it can perform better classification. With a neural network or deep learning model, you'd want to adjust. Uh, the number of neurons, so the number of hidden layers for it, so that um, that model, the trained version of the model is most reliable, for example. And so that can take, you know, days, it could take weeks, it could take hours. But, you know, the idea is once you have a high reliability model, then you can, um, then you can deploy it. And so that, that, that delays are not on the critical path of getting, um, uh, you know, daily daily results. You get results of the same day the tweets come in. Basically, it's just training the model ahead of time is a is a process that takes some time. And um, we're not talking the better part of a year. We're talking, you know, hours to to weeks or something along those lines. Um, um, yeah, glad, glad if that's useful. Um, um, uh, how much time for cleaning classification? Yeah, um, yeah. The, the surveillance is live. The surveillance is live. It's it's just it's the it's the training of the model, getting this model that's really good at um, at at being able to recognize, you know, symptomatic tweets from not. Um, that's what takes the time. And then once that's available, you, it's real time. It it it's you know basically applying it is it's not a significant delay at all. Um, um, is, is, is there a number, a limit to the number of parameters we could simultaneously calibrate? What about 10 or 20? Yeah. So, um, good question. Um, 
so my lab, one of the areas my lab has tended to be um, uh, very, uh, you know, notable uh, worldwide is we, we have done a lot of work with, with, with calibration and empirically grounded models. Um, this is an area I followed with interest in some of the TAs like Yuan Chen um, has methodological contributions on con, um, uh, co uh, combinations of, of calibration and, um, um, and sensitivity analysis. And many of the methods you'll see discussed in this boot camp, like particle filtering, particle MCMC, uh, approximate patient computation. Um, these are tools where, you know, we really pride the ability to, um, particularly the first two of those to, to lead in these areas. Um, uh, and calibration, we have explored a lot in very disparate projects. And this issue of how many parameters that can you calibrate comes up a lot. Um, and um, I'm going to tell you a few things. Here. So first of all, um, calibration of, of many parameters is possible if you have a lot of data to match it. So it, think about uh, overfitting, right? If, 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 you, um, if you have very little data, and you have many parameters, well, it's not just an overfitting issue. It's, it's matters that in, in engineering are, are called underdetermined or overdetermined system. If you have many, many parameters and you have very few data, um, there may be many combinations of parameter values that will account for that data equally well. It's underdetermined. You, you have many degrees of freedom and you can't pin them all down with the data. Um, uh, you, you're just not able to, to, to pin down a single interpretation. It's not identifiable. The more data you have, the more identifiable it will be generally. Um, and, and then at some point you get to a point where, um, you know, it, it may be that no one combination of parameters is, is fully adequate um, and you're finding the best, the best match to it. Um, but, um, can you do 10 parameters? Yes, you could do 10 parameters. 20, it's, it's kind of getting it off a lot. And the fact is the amount of work that you have to do to explore. A, so, so think about it that way. You may remember that cube. I, you know, I, I have it up here somewhere. Um, uh, hopefully I could show you that gelatinous cube. So um, uh, here, um, yeah. So if I were to, um, uh, to, to remind you with the cube, uh, if we have, and I'll put this up on a slideshow, um, here we go, and boom. Um, so here's our, here's our cube. Uh, um, you may remember this term calibration, but the idea was we have several parameters. We've called them for brevity, beta, mu, and, and tau, and we'll see they, they come from a particular model here. But um, um, these would be different parameters. Uh, this might be the length of time it takes to recover, mean recovery time in months. Excuse me, that's mu here. Uh, um, mean incubation period in months is, is tau, et cetera. And those are each parameters. And so if, if we want to find the best combination of them, in terms of producing results for calibration that best match the data. We're talking about exploring this cube. Um, and exploring a cube takes, you know, takes considerable work. You got to go to these different areas of the cube, right? If there were just two parameters, it would be a like a sheet of paper, right? It would be two dimensional. You know, maybe beta along here and, and mu along there, these two parameters here. Um, it would just be, uh, you know, a sheet. It's like looking at the cube from the bottom, right? Or looking at it from the top. Um, you just have beta and mu. Uh, if if that's all you had to explore, it would take less work to explore it. If you have three dimensions, you have to explore more. If you have four dimensions, well, it's kind of hard to imagine. But um, um, you can imagine a cube appearing at time and kind of lasting, and then disappearing at time, or something like that. And, you got to explore all dimensions, including time. Five dimensions is getting bigger, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
gosh, you're exploring a very, very large volume. <laughs> and, and your ability to really, in a timely fashion, explore that value gets, gets limited. Um, so it's not merely a matter of how much data do you have, it's how much do you, can you really explore this volume. And once you get to 20, I'm, I'm not very sanguine about that. I, I, I really think you might be fooling yourself here. You'll be in one particular sub area of this tw giant 20 dimensional space. And, uh, you know, I, I just lack, lack confidence. You're, you're really going to be meaningfully exploring that space. It's the curse of dimensionality is just going to be too large. And even 10 dimensions is really pushing it. Um, so, so what to do? Well, um, uh, one thing you can do is to successively calibrate parameters. And what this means is um, a colleague of mine used to, I think drawing on an analogy by um, John Sturman at MIT, um, has analogized it to kind of unpeeling an onion. So you start with the inner part of the onion and, and you're calibrating that part of the model. Um, and then you sort of let layer in the next thing and you calibrate some additional parameters for that, but you don't recalibrate the inner ones. And then you layer on some, some others. So you're taking advantage of the fact that there's kind of core parts of the system and, and broader parts. And that could be an effective way, strategy. There's also a technique known as, um, that has a certain conceptual similarity to that partial model calibration where you kind of calibrate a part of a model treating certain things as fixed and, and treating data from the rest of the system as data. And then you sort of enlarge from that. And, and it's actually a very elegant process. And there's literature uh, uh, to, to, to support that. And we've used similar processes before in some of our published work. So, in short, you break up the calibration problem into sub-problems with calibration. And it's not perfect, but it's probably better than trying to calibrate 10 parameters at once or 20 parameters at once. I have seen 10 done successfully, I will say that, or at least it, it got good results. I've seen that in a number of times, but uh, you know, I, I start to feel a little bit queasy um, when I see that because I, I just have my doubts about the degree to which it'll be really well explored. Glad if that's uh, if that's useful. Um, there are other, you know, other possibilities here too um, that I I won't talk about. Um, but um, uh, you know, those are those are some thoughts on the calibration part. Okay. Um, uh, glad if that's useful. So um, I think we'll stop for a break now, and we'll uh, resume in. Six, six minutes and at 10 o'clock and, and we'll, we'll dive into some material. So uh, thanks very much and see you shortly.